Good evening, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased to, you could join us this evening for our look at Brothers at Arms, when the United States spoke French, the role of France in the American Revolution and its aftermath. Whether you're here in person watching us on YouTube or on C-SPAN, thanks for joining us. It's a special evening, um, appropriate evening for us to be doing this on April 20th, 2017, because 240 years ago today, Lafayette left France for the United States. <laughs> we present this program in partnership with the French American Cultural Foundation and the American Revolution Institute of the Study of Cincinnati, and we thank them for their support. After the panel discussion, please stop in the lobby where our two authors will be signing their books. And before we get started, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up soon in this theater. Tomorrow at noon, we welcome David Nichols, the author of Ike and McCarthy, Dwight Eisenhower's Secret Campaign Against Joseph McCarthy. Using documents that had been previously unavailable or overlooked at the Eisenhower Library, Nichols chronicles President Eisenhower's involvement in the downfall of Senator McCarthy. On Tuesday, April 25th, also at noon, Elizabeth Cobbs will tell us about women sent to France during World War I to be switchboard operators. Her new book, The Hello Girls, American Women First, America's First Women Soldiers, will also be for sale here. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, can tell us our monthly calendar of events in print or online. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. And you'll also find brochures about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation, National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activity. And there are applications for membership in the lobby where you can become a member. And a little known secret that I keep telling people about is no one has ever been turned down for membership in the National Archives Foundation. <laughs> Americans advocating separation from Great Britain knew they had to have the backing of a ma major European power, and not just moral support, but material in the form of money, supplies, and men. England's ancient, ancient rivals, France and Spain, were the logical places to turn. From the earliest days of the war, Benjamin Franklin and other American envoys lobbied the courts of France and Spain. In the National Archives, we have the papers of the Continental Congress, which contain the long-running correspondence between Congress and its envoys abroad. The American diplomats' efforts were rewarded in the 1778 Treaty of Alliance and the Treaty of Amity and Commerce with France and the entry of Spain into the war in 1779. Arms and supplies from the Spanish governor of Louisiana aided the American cause, and at the end of the war, the French army and navy made the car, made, made, the, made the Yorktown victory possible. The stories of our nation's early days cannot be told without reference to the records here at the National Archives. Diplomatic correspondence, treaties, military commissions, and more and more documents on the international side of the American Revolution. The two authors we have with us tonight will enlighten us about roles, the roles France and Spain played in our country's formative years. So let's now hear from the panel. To lead the discussion tonight, we're happy to have Rosemary Zagari, a professor of history at George Mason University and the author of Revolutionary Backlash, Women in Politics in the Early American Republic. Larry D. Ferrero, the author of Brothers at Arms, American Independence, and Men of France and Spain Who Saved It, teaches history and engineering at George Mason University. And Francois Furstenberg, the author of When the United States Spoke French, is professor of history at Johns Hopkins. But most importantly, um, Francois's parents. Are the Furstenbergs here? If you've ever shopped at Bread First on Connecticut, Furstenberg, first. There it is. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rosemary Zagari, Larry Ferrero, and Francois Furstenberg.
Well, good evening. I'm Rosemary Zagari from George Mason University, and we're thrilled to see you all here tonight uh, for this wonderful program. Um, the first item of business is to let you know that it will not be in French, so <laughs> um, maybe you're disappointed, but maybe you're relieved. In any case, uh, what we'd like to do first is have um, each of our authors speak to you for a few minutes about their books and give you a general sense about what they uh, talk about in their books. And we will be talking among ourselves and try and give you a good understanding of some of the issues that they discuss. And these are issues that you may not have thought about because when we think about early America, the revolutionary and post-revolutionary periods, we tend to think primarily about England and the new United States. And this discussion will introduce you to whole other dimensions of the conflict involving France and Spain. So let's start with uh, Professor Ferraro, and he will talk about his book, Brothers at Arms. Thank you. So in early 1776, Britain <clears throat> was engaged in a war with America. And America, of course, was fighting for independence, but without gunpowder, without guns, without artillery, without a navy. So it was only France and Spain who were the historical enemies of Britain um, that had both the military and the naval strength to defeat the British, which is why we needed um, their alliance. But they wouldn't ally with us if they saw it simply as a civil war. They had to be convinced that we were fighting as a sovereign nation, as a separate nation. And you can see John Adams' quote up there, um, which I have to turn and, and read, <laughs> um, that foreign powers uh, would not engage with us until we had acknowledged ourselves as an independent nation. And Adams was not known as a fan of foreign entanglements. Thomas Jefferson also said that a declaration of independence alone would allow European powers to treat with us. So this is important. The declaration was not <clears throat> commissioned by Congress as a message to George III. He'd already gotten the memo. He, had, uh, he knew that the Americans were fighting for independence. And the Americans knew this. They also uh, <clears throat> weren't sending the declaration for the American people because the American people had sent their delegates to Philadelphia to vote for independence. In fact, <clears throat> the document that is upstairs in the rotunda was written specifically as a call to arms, an engraved invitation asking uh, France and Spain to come fight alongside us. Now, when we started um, the war, we were bereft of gunpowder, uh, guns, artillery. I mentioned that. And it was France and Spain who first um, began to furnish all of these arms. Uh, even before the Declaration of Independence uh, had been signed, a French merchant named Beaumarchais and Silas Dean, who was the um, American envoy in Paris, were negotiating for the sale of arms uh, to come to the United States. And in late 1776, early 1777, a large shipment of arms under Beaumarchais carried uh, 20,000 guns and other accoutrements that uh, arrived just in time to supply the Americans who were about to face Burgoyne at um, Saratoga. And you can see this quote by Caleb Stark, who was there and who knew what, what happened, that unless these Beaumarchais arms had been timely furnished to the Americans, he said, um, Burgoyne would have made an easy march to Albany. So it was actually French arms which turned the tide of battle and, of course, gave uh, the Americans their first taste of victory, a uh, major victory, at Saratoga. Now, in the meantime, there were volunteers from France and from other parts of Europe who came to the United States. Now, ca they came to fight the British because that was where the enemy was. But along the way, they came to make the American cause their own. And <coughs> Washington came to depend upon these immigrants who got the job done, as the musical Hamilton <laughs> so aptly portrays. So um, from 
my right, um, Louis Lebeg Duporte became Washington's right hand man. He was the engineer, he planned the fortifications, the sieges, and he understood strategy. And he was able to um, help Washington develop and deploy the strategic intent of the Continental Army. That Continental Army fought as a professional army under the uh, not so gentle gaze and lash of uh, Baron von Steuben, who uh, created a training program that not only at Valley Forge, but then long afterwards, uh, took a somewhat ragtag group of militia and formed an army that could actually go toe to toe against the British. And of course, um, Lafayette, the best known of the group, uh, ended up uh, with an independent command in the Southern Theater. And in, that, um, engage, in those engagements, he kept Cornwallis from coming north, and he also followed Cornwallis all the way to Yorktown. Now back in Europe, there were two individuals who were the most important characters in this whole story. Um, uh, to my right uh, was the French foreign minister, the Comte de Vergennes. And of all the characters, he was the one who made most of the major decisions that concerned the alliances both between um, the France and the United States and between France and Spain. France and Spain were allied. They'd been um, uh, allied through military and family ties. It was called the Bourbon Family Compact. Um, both kings were actually uh, descended from Louis XIV. And even though they were allied, they had much different goals. The goal of uh, France under Vergennes was to sufficiently weaken Britain so that it could regain the balance of power that it had lost during the Seven Years' War, uh, which had uh, ended just a decade earlier. Um, in that alliance was also Spain. Spain had also come out rather badly during the war, uh, the Seven Years' War, and they lost a lot of territory, including Florida. So Spain's primary goal was to regain territory. Um, the French American alliance of 1778 brought France into the war for the first time. And what that did was um, bring, most importantly, the French Navy into American waters. Uh, any war at this time with Britain was always going to be a naval war. Remember, Britannia ruled the waves. So it prevented Britain suddenly from having the kind of dominance it was used to to be able to resupply and move troops around. That knocked them back on their heels, but it would not have been enough until the Spanish foreign minister, the Conde de Florida Blanca, on my left, who, as I mentioned, established the Spanish goals of recovering territory like Gibraltar and Florida, um, to come into the war. And the entry of Spain into the war a year later, 1779, fundamentally changed the nature of the war from a regional clash in North America to a global conflict. And the combined Spanish and French navies outnumbered the British, and they were overwhelmed. They had to defend not only their troops and territories in North America, but their colonies in the Caribbean. They had to defend uh, lands such as Gibraltar and Menorca, even as far away as India. Meanwhile, back in Louisiana, Bernardo de Galvez, who was the, um, the governor of Spanish Louisiana, was supplying uh, the American troops in the Western theater with um, gunpowder and uh, guns and supplies. But as soon as war was declared in 1779, he launched a series of raids that uh, brought down the British posts at Mobile, Natchez, and at Baton Rouge. But the goal was always Pensacola, which was the um, uh, capital of British West Florida and was the key to the Gulf of Mexico, which Spain wanted to recapture. And after a few setbacks by a series of devastating hurricanes, in 1781, <clears throat> he launched a joint Spanish-French attack that took Pensacola and got the British out of the Gulf of Mexico, which happened at just the right time because right about then, <clears throat> the, um, 
is a French commander, the Comte de Grasse, came to the Caribbean and asked the Spanish to please guard the French colonies in the Caribbean. Remember, that's where the money was, sugar plantations in the Caribbean. Please guard those colonies from the British while I take my entire fleet north to the Chesapeake. Now, the Comte de Grasse was a fighting admiral. He was loved by his sailors who said of him, the Comte de Grasse stands six foot four and six foot five on days of battle. <clears throat> Washington and Rochambeau learned that de Grasse was heading to the Chesapeake, and so they raced south from New York to meet him and surround Cornwallis at Yorktown. Now, when they got there and Washington came aboard um, de Grasse's flagship, the Ville de Paris, um, de Grasse, who stood two inches taller than Washington, exclaimed, mon petit général. It's a, it's a, real, it's a real story. Um, and oh, by the way, since you asked, yes, he was one of the ancestors of the rock star astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, de Grasse was landing his fleet around uh, the Chesapeake when the British fleet under Thomas Graves appeared. Uh, de Grasse sortied his entire fleet, uh, defeated Graves, or rather drove him off. And once that happened, the British uh, forces at Yorktown could neither be resupplied um, nor evacuated, and that sealed their fate. And the story of Yorktown is, is pretty well known. Um, Washington and Rochambeau led the troops on a short, quick march, surrounded um, Yorktown, laid siege for five days. And that siege was directed by French officers who also directed the trenches, the, the gunfire, and, they, and it was the, the French also lost twice as many men as the Americans. So when um, Charles O'Hara, who was uh, Cornwallis' second in command, came out to offer the surrender, he saw it as a French victory. And he offered the surrender to Rochambeau. But Rochambeau, of course, knew the moment belonged to Washington. So he directed O'Hara to Washington. Washington would not take a surrender from somebody else's second in command. So he directed him to Benjamin Lincoln, his own second in command. <coughs> and the battle was over. Now, the battle was over, but the war was not. Because I just said that the war was a world war. By the time Yorktown was fought, Britain was fighting five separate nation states, and they were overwhelmed. The United States, France, Britain, they dragged the Dutch Republic into it, and the Kingdom of Mysore in India. All were um, fighting Britain at this time. So in summary, um, during this battle, during, sorry, this war, um, 200,000 French and Spanish soldiers and sailors fought as compared with about 250,000 to 380,000 Americans. They were as invested in this war as we were. That's so why I want you to know that America could never have won the war without France, and France would never have fought the war without Spain. And what I hope all of you take away uh, is this, that America did not achieve independence by itself. Uh, instead, it was born as the centerpiece of an international coalition, which together worked to defeat a common adversary. And that's pretty much who we are today. We are the centerpiece of um, international coalitions striving towards a common goal. And that's why we remain today the indispensable nation. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have Professor Francois Furstenberg <laughs> talk about his book, When the United States Spoke French. Thanks, Rosie. Uh, okay. Oh, that's supposed to. Here we Here go. We <laughs> um, well, let me begin by thanking Rosie for, for Rosemary Zagari for, for um, moderating this, this panel discussion. It's really terrific. It's an honor to be here also with, um, with Larry. And, and thanks to um, David Ferrero and Susan Clifton for, for um, hosting. Uh, at, it's really a, an ideal pairing, I think, these two books, because in many ways, um, I mean, if I'd written the book a little bit later, uh, I, I would have understood it as a sequel, I think, to Larry's. Um, it's OK. So, I'm so glad you wrote yours first, because <laughs> I would have leaned heavily on it. <laughs> I think it would have sold a lot more. Um, 
as we have, um, as we've learned, the, the American Revolution really was was a, a French victory. I think that's fair to say, uh, something like that. Um, it, or at least I think it's it's uh, fair to say that it was a, a French war as much as it was French and Spanish war as much as it was an American war. Um, and you know, maybe one of the things we can talk about actually is is. I mean, I was I've been thinking about this, you know, in the wake of reading your book. We we really need a new a new name for this war, don't we? Mm. Um, so. In, in a sense, I mean, everything that I'll talk about sort of follows from, from what Larry was talking about, because just as the, the Seven Years' War uh, led into the American Revolution, so did the American Revolution lead uh, a, a decade later into, the, into, into another war, into the French Revolution and, and the Napoleonic Wars, which lasted um, for uh, you know, nearly a quarter, a quarter century. Now, there are lots of, of, fac uh, of factors, of causes of the French Revolution. I think, I think probably few things have been as studied as that one. But, um, but I think it's fair to say that debt, the, the revolution, the debt left over from French involvement in the American Revolution, because everything that you were talking about um, was enormously expensive. <coughs> it's a lesson that people seem to keep forgetting, that wars are very expensive. And, um, and this left a, a crushing debt on the French government. And it was that debt that really was the catalyst for the French Revolution. And when the French Revolution broke out, um, Americans were, were thrilled. They could hardly have been more excited by the events. This was the most powerful monarchy in Europe that had suddenly, out of nowhere, fallen to its knees. It was like, it was like a, a dream, I think, for people. It seemed surreal. It's hard to capture the excitement, I think, and the, and the shock. You have to think of, of May of 1968, maybe, the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, the Arab Spring, President Donald Trump, all these, all these uh, astonishing, sort of unbelievable events, uh, all of them wrapped up into this one spectacular moment. And best of all, Americans uh, thought that they had really started this all. In, uh, in 1792, France became a republic, and the excitement in the United States reached a frenzy. Everywhere there were parades, there were marches, songs, toasts. People were marching in the street. And then in January of 1793, King Louis XVI the, the was executed, and aristocrats began to ma be massacred in the streets of Paris. And thousands of people fled, including many of them, to the United States. And so I, the, the book that I wrote was about five of these, um, is about five of these uh, refugees who came, of these emigres who came to the United States on their American adventure. And I thought sort of using their stories would be a way of looking at early American history from, from a different perspective, from, from slightly different eyes. Now, I, I had originally envisioned this. This is the, the, the story of many books, I'm sure, as a small little project, something um, that I could get over in, in, a, in a couple of years. Uh, but, but it quickly sort of ballooned into something much bigger. Um, and it took me way Two beyond big Paris. Books. Yeah, <laughs> it took me way beyond Paris and, and Philadelphia, through uh, through London and into the Caribbean and deep into the American continental interior. Um, and it grew beyond the, the five aristocrats who I who I started the book with, um, to include bankers in Amsterdam, slaves in Haiti, uh, aristocrats in London, Native Americans in the Ohio Valley, and and many of the many other people. And all of them, it turned out, were were involved with the story that I was um, that I was trying to tell about the, the these five figures. So um, I don't have you know, a whole lot of time uh, tonight to, to tell you all about the book. Um, I'll introduce you briefly to the, to the five characters who kind of structure the account, um, and then tell you the two, you know, three or four sort of important lessons that I kind of drew from the research um, that I did and the, and the writing that I did. Um, and then we can, we can elaborate on that as, as we talk it through, and then we'll have some, some Q&A. So. so the first of the characters who I studied, um, and, and certainly the most famous today, is Talleyrand. Um, the Talleyrand, the former French archbishop who sat in the Constituent Assembly and who proposed the nationalization of church lands. He would go on to become France's longest serving and most, uh, and most famous foreign minister, and he would largely reshape the map of, of Europe. And he spent a couple of years here along with, with all the, the, these others. There was also uh, Louis-Marie, the Vicomte de Noailles, who was Lafayette's brother-in-law and who actually uh, fought, as one of the characters in Larry's book, he fought, he fought in the American Revolution. He was, he, was, uh, it was, he was the person who actually nego negotiated French terms on, um, at the surrender, at Cornwallis's surrender. In the, in the 1780s, after he returned back to France, he became a, a major figure in French reform circles, and it was he who presided over the Constituent Assembly on the historic night of August 4th, 1789, when feudalism was, was formally abolished. The third character was the, the Duc de la Rochefoucauld Yancourt, who was one of the wealthiest aristocrats of old regime France. Uh, as the master of the king's wardrobe, it was Liancourt who famously burst into the king's bedchambers on the night of July 14, 1789, to, to tell him of the uprising in Paris. Is it a revolt, the king asked? Non, sire, c'est une révolution, Liancourt famously replied. Then there was the Comte de, de Volnay, who was a traveler 
and a, and a philosophe, a famous writer, and a future senator. And the last character was Moreau de Saint-Marie, who was a, a lawyer and a historian who'd been born in the Caribbean, uh, who'd married into a wealthy planter family and gone to Paris to write about the Caribbean and to enter uh, French politics. So these men were all, um, were all aristocrats, but they were liberal aristocrats. They, they saw themselves following in the footsteps of the American Revolution. They admired the, the new United States and the Constitution that, that, had been, um, that had been recently crafted, and they hoped to implement a constitutional monarchy in France that would look somewhat similar, substantially similar to the, to the uh, US Constitution. And when the revolution began, when the French Revolution began, they became its leaders. And I think, um, I think it's, it's fair to say that had history taken a different path, they would today be considered the, uh, the, the French Republic's founding fathers would be singing songs about them, maybe. Um, but that wasn't the path that, that history took. They were, they were forced to flee, and they came to the United States and settled in, in Philadelphia. So as I say, I don't, I don't have time to talk about the whole book. We've got some copies on sale outside. Uh, but I'll just make a few points here um, and talk about you know, the, the most, what, what I really took, uh, what sort of surprised me as I did the research, or was really reinforced as I did the research and the, and the writing on this, point, uh, on this book. And, they, and, and the first really kind of builds on, on what Larry was talking about. Um, the, the, the kind of marginality, if you want to think about it that way, of, of the United States, these aren't your words, but I'll, I'll sort of rephrase that. I mean, it, the emigres uh, came at a time when the United States was, was nothing like the power it is today. I think it really takes a kind of leap of imagination to, to understand the, the country as it was then, this, this weak, fragile collection of 13 states, really puny uh, power riven by divisions, continually under siege by native and foreign um, powers. Today, the United States is, is a continental and even global power, but back then, it, its sovereignty extended from the Atlantic coast as far as the Appalachian Mountains with just a few fingers of sovereignty jutting into Kentucky and Tennessee. The heart of the Atlantic economy was in the South, in the Caribbean. That was Europe's main interest in the Americas, the, the islands, as Larry was saying, that produced unbelievably rich stores of sugar, coffee, indigo, and all the commodities that were powering the Atlantic and the European economy. And in fact, it was to protect uh, these islands, these, these, these uh, French investments, that France had intervened in the American Revolution. That, that may have been the major reason it intervened in the American Revolution. American harbors and ports uh, were, would, were expected to provide bases, naval bases, for the French, uh, for French naval operations in the Caribbean. American resources like lumber and wheat would supply the, the um, sugar colonies as just as they had been for so many uh, decades supplying the British sugar colonies. And so it was these, these kind of geostrategic interests that motivated French entry into the American Revolution. And these were the benefits that France, that French authorities expected to reap after the American Revolution, using American harbors, uh, American ships, uh, American provisions to supply their, their colonies. Now, it didn't work out as, as they'd hoped for reasons that we can, we can talk about. The French Revolution also um, quickly spilled over into the Caribbean. Shortly after revolution exploded in France, insurrection broke out in Saint-Domingue, which is today's Haiti. In 1791, slaves in the northern part of the colony began a rebellion that soon turned into a revolution against slavery itself. Under the leadership of, of Toussaint Louverture, Haitian forces fought off French planters, invading Spanish forces uh, and the British Navy. In fact, the Americans needed France and Spain to defeat the British. The Haitians, alone, without any support, defeated the French, the Spanish, and the British. <laughs> the Haitian Revolution would upend the Atlantic economy and the, and the labor regime on which it depended, and it would bring tens of thousands <coughs> of refugees pouring into the United States. And so this was another lesson that really was driven home powerfully uh, uh, over the course of, of writing book, this book, was the importance of the Haitian Revolution for American history in this period. Um, I think it's really impossible to tell the story of how the United States was transformed from this weak, fragile power into a continental power and eventually a global power without, um, without a, incorporating the history of the Caribbean. And the last thing that I, that I learned that, that I'll talk about here is to think about Philadelphia in, in completely different ways than I had before. Now, Philadelphia was the, was the capital of the United States, um, and, and it's where the, the refugees that I was looking at um, all settled. But it was a really very different city then from, from what it is today. It was a population of about 40,000 people, which is you know, roughly the size of, a, of an American, large American university, not even in the top 10, actually, of American universities. 
Uh, but the city itself, geographically, was tiny. It was it, um, virtually all the population was huddled along the banks of the of the Delaware River. So it was incredibly dense city, a density of of seventeen thousand people per square kilometer, which is much denser than Philadelphia or even or even Manhattan of today. To see that kind of population density, you have to look to Bombay um, today. And thousands of French people poured into this mix, mostly coming up from the Caribbean. Um, and it's I think it's it's hard to assess exact numbers. I mean, I, I never was able to figure out exactly how many, um, but uh, somewhere between 3,000 and 8,000 French people came uh, into, into Philadelphia in this period. So that's somewhere between 8 and 20% of the city, which was all of a sudden French speaking. And no, so this is a really face to face city, you know, 40,000 people living in an area much smaller than a, than a, a medium sized university campus. So the sudden arrival of all these thousands of French people uh, is, was, a, was a significant event. And these waves of refugees pouring into the city really altered its social and its cultural life in this period. French wine and silk and mustard began arriving from distant ports. Merchants built grand, uh, enormous houses in French neoclassical style and filled them with refined French furniture, ornate French tapestries, exquisite gobelin porcelain. The aroma of French food wafted through the alleys behind second uh, South 2nd Street, including the delicacies prepared by Marino, who was a, a pastry chef who'd once worked at the French court at Versailles. French revolutionary songs were performed nightly in the Chestnut Street Theater and echoed off the cobblestones of the city's streets. Madame Mercier, who'd studied with Marie Antoinette's hairdresser, opened a, a shop catering to Philadelphia's transnational clientele. French silversmiths, French dentists, French dance instructors, all of them were applying their, their services. Um, the French language rang out on Philadelphia's streets and, and did its most refined social circles. French newspapers, French bookstores, French taverns, all of these shaped the city's uh, cosmopolitan public sphere. And so my, um, my five figures all settled in this one little Philadelphia neighborhood. Uh, they all lived together, they ate together, they socialized together, and they, they forged really intimate connections with each other. Every day that he was in Philadelphia, according to Moho Talleyrand, would, would drop by in the evening we opened our hearts to one another. We poured out our feelings. Each of us knew the other's most intimate thoughts. And Talleyrand ate nearly every day at a Franco-Dutch banker's house um, because, because, as he said, this, this, um, this Dutch banker employed a French chef. Talleyrand um, commented, the United States are the only country where if there are 32 religions, there's only one dish. <laughs> and it's a bad one, he added. <laughs> so. Um, over, over the, the course of the research, I realized that the 1780s and the 1790s uh, was, was this kind of largely forgotten moment, I think, when the United States was most turned, or this aspect, I think, of this period, was, which is largely forgotten, is, is that this was the period when the United States was most turned uh, towards the world in general and towards France in particular. Uh, these merchants who, who, who structured the, so, the elite social life of Philadelphia had all gone rich off French trade, off trade with France and the French Caribbean, um, and it was into these circles that, that, my, um, that my guys so, socialized. And following the emigres' encounters took me through Philadelphia's uh, elite salons and parlors, and it eventually brought me in contact with um, the continental interior, where they were investing heavily in backcountry lands, a story that I'd, that I'd never um, occurred to me and never, never thought to, to sort of follow up on it. And eventually it brought me in, in contact with these important geopolitical issues bearing on the United States' relationship with the Caribbean, um, and ultimately uh, on the Louisiana Purchase, or the Louisiana Sale, as you want to, you, um, you know, depending on your perspective, I suppose. And, um, which was all, as I say, tied up with events taking place um, in the Caribbean. So, so the, the period from 1793 to 1803 witnessed uh, what I think is a really extraordinary transformation. Where the United States had once been hemmed in between the Atlantic coast and the Appalachian Mountains, its territory stretched all the way to the Atlantic, uh, to, the, to the Rocky Mountains by 1803. And it was on the way, the country was on the way to becoming a great power. And, and much like, like Larry's story of the American Revolution, all of these transformations, I think, can't be understood without reference to events um, taking place in Europe and the Caribbean. And, and you know, I think the, the, the point in many ways of both of these books is, is the extent to which we, we American history, our history, is really so intimately tied up with these histories of, of other parts of the world. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Well, let me start with a question for both of you, because I'm sure the audience is curious about knowing how each of you turned toward or found your project, how your own background or interests led you to this slightly offbeat path. Go ahead. 
Um, <laughs> well, for me, it was, um, so, so uh, my mother's French. I mean, my name is, is Francois. Um, and I always had, um, you know, I always had what uh, I suppose economists would call a kind of comparative advantage in terms of um, <laughs> re being, able to read, uh, being able to read a foreign language, something that very few American historians, I'm sorry to say, uh, Larry accepted, are, are, are able to do. Um, but I, I wasn't, you know, interested in doing French history or even kind of French inflected histories of the United States. I mean, my, my first book was on George Washington's image. You know, it's like a really <laughs> as, as American as you can get. Um, and uh, I think so. What what changed it actually it was it was in a sense. I mean, you know, the, it's less about kind of intellectual trajectories and and more in my case at least about sort of personal trajectories. I, I got a job in, at the University of Montreal, which is a, a francophone institution. So, um, and you know, in in Quebec. Um, and I was teaching American history, U.S. history, to French students, to Francophone students. Um, and I was in a department where there were only two of us out of, I don't know, 20, 25 or 28 people who were working on, on U.S. history. Um, and, and in many ways, this was a really interesting place for me to be. And, it, and I, I don't think I would have done this book, actually, if I'd been teaching somewhere else in a, in a U.S. department in a bigger, in, in a bigger, where there were more American historians. But, but I wanted to try to make connections, I think, with, with my colleagues and with my students. Um, so I was trying to figure out something that would connect the, the period of American history that I was interested in with um, with France or with the Atlantic world um, and you know and I, I guess it was also I should say a time um, when when many historians many prominent historians were kind of expanding their focus I mean there was a move at the time to kind of internationalize or Atlanticize American history so so the path had been open for me um, by by a lot of scholarship um, but it but it meant that I was able to to work in this field you know to make what might have been um, a sort of marginal account to to, to um, it was something that was going to draw the attention of, of, of other historians, I think, because it fit into the kind of problems that we were talking about um, at the time. So, so you know, it's really a combination of, of kind of the intellectual historic, historical context, but, and then the fact that I just, you know, I, I wanted to do something, um, you know, sort of French inflected francophone uh, in a sense. Well, I came at it from a much different direction. I'm a naval architect by profession. Now, I designed ships for many years. Um, my wife is from Peru, which is, although I have a Spanish last name, why I learned Spanish. Um, and as part of my job, I went to the, uh, France to work in their Navy for several years um, in their ship design division and did a lot of uh, research on the side. And then, um, by the way, I, I would tell all my French colleagues, uh, because of course I had to learn French to work there, is that I learned French for business, but I learned Spanish for love. <laughs> uh, my wife still likes that. Uh, <laughs> So while I was there, and our first uh, firstborn son, Marcel, was, was born there, uh, French name, uh, <laughs> I, I began studying the roots of my profession and decided to get my doctorate in um, uh, history of technology and look at the rise of shipbuilding in the age of sail. That's really what I was interested in. And there I discovered that France and Spain had worked together right after the Seven Years' War had ended, almost before the ink was dry on the Treaty of Paris to rebuild their navy and create a combined navy that was going to defeat Britain. And they did that by, by sharing shipbuilders and engineers and artillerists. And so, as, and this all became part of my, my doctoral work. So I knew going into, as my children were, were growing up, that they um, had combined their forces and it was that combined navy that really was the key to the defeat of Britain. But when my children were in school and I saw that France was barely mentioned in the story of the revolution and the, the Spanish not at all, I began to wonder why there was a gap between what I knew and what I saw. And when I kind of lobbed the idea to my agent, um, she said, I think there's a story there. And I said, I think so. So I spent the next year schlepping my, my kids up and down battlefields and encampments and, and, and uh, Learn, you know, in addition to the work that I'd already been doing in the archives, found a much wider story than um, America had started in, you know, 1776, and uh, you, you all know the, 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 the battles. It was a world war. And again, just to be very clear, any kind of war that anybody was fighting Britain at the time was always going to be a naval war. So, um, I got into the story in a large part because of my, my naval background, but also <clears throat> because when you're doing anything involving engineering, you're always, excuse me, looking at um, what the larger context is. So why were they building, why were they 
building up this fleet, which is a huge investment in manpower, in, uh, in supplies, and there was a political intent um, to defeat Britain, and America was always going, for France and Spain, uh, America was always going to be part of that equation. They always knew that America was going to be um, going up against Britain at some point, and they certainly were prepared to uh, exploit the, Amer the, the American Revolution that they knew was going to happen um, long before we did as part of that goal. So what I saw was um, a fleet that was built to uh, create a, what, what amounted to a large coalition that would uh, eventually defeat a, a common enemy, each one for their own reasons. And that's no bad thing. You, you don't go to war um, because you are being altruistic. What I saw were three nations that each had individual uh, goals, but those goals had a, a common purpose, and that's why they allied. And that's pretty much what we do today, just to be very clear. When we ally with other nations, we, we do so for our own interest. So I saw a lot of parallels between then and today. And that's really what, what got me into this. Yeah. I mean, I think what's so interesting about this kind of approach to the late 18th century is that it wrenches us out of our traditional United States-centered narrative. And we see how interconnected America was with the rest of the world. And I think it's easy for a lot of non-historians to think, oh, globalization, that's a 20th or 21st century invention, or we didn't have world wars until the 20th century. And so what your work, both of your work does, is, is really help us see that this, these kinds of connections of people, of alliances, of geopolitics existed you know, for, for centuries, if not millennia. But one thing that I noticed, neither one of you addressed, your remarks obviously had to be brief, but you know, there was a lot of suspicion toward France and toward French people um, in America because after all, before the American Revolution, the people in North America were largely Anglo-American. They considered themselves British and France was the traditional enemy of, of Britain. And there was also a very strong anti-Catholic element. And so for each of your periods, I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, attitudes toward France or the French that Americans encountered, suspicion, hostilities, or opening, welcome with open arms, and how you think it, it changed American attitudes toward France. Should we do it chronologically? Sure. So, you make the, uh, all the right, exactly the, 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 the points that um, I found that uh, the sentiment against the French, which was uh, in part because they'd been the enemy during the, what we call the French and Indian Wars, the, the, it was called the Seven Years' War, uh, was only a decade old. The, 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 the memories were very strong. And uh, the religion and all the other aspects meant that when the first French troops and volunteers were coming, they were not well regarded. Um, Nathaniel Green uh, actually uh, said, these are so many spies in our camp. That's how he referred to them. <coughs> but when the first battles, uh, especially, and I point this out at Brandywine, um, erupted, uh, things changed. The Congress, Washington, the other officers, really didn't know what to do with these people. They were coming in, some of them um, quite brusque in, in terms of uh, where they wanted to be placed. They were experienced soldiers, but there was no political way to insert them into the American military system, which was as much political because generals were chosen based on state more than they were based on um, their, their uh, you know, there weren't that many battles that they'd fought prior to this. So it was kind of hard to see who did better in battle. Um, and that really made things quite difficult for the Congress. But when uh, the Battle of Brandywine and then a few subsequent battles were fought and they just had to throw them into the mix, um, these French volunteers did quite well. Uh, in fact, I, I point out that um, one of them, uh, you may not know his name, uh, it's uh, Desidre de Fleury, 
um, was an engineer, and today's Army Corps of Engineers now has a medal, uh, the Fleury Medal, for courage and boldness. Um, and it was that slow uh, first acceptance that these uh, French volunteers were equal to the Americans in terms of, of how they could fight. And then eventually, they showed that they were able to contribute and contribute a lot. And they became, uh, I just said, you know, the, the immigrants who got the job done. Uh, Washington relied on them. Congress accepted them. So by the end of the war, um, there was a real, co it was really coalition warfare in the sense that we kind of think of today. Um, I give a lot of, um, I, I spend a lot of um, room in, in, my, in my book uh, talking about the relationship later in the war between Rochambeau and Washington. Because those two really did see each other as equals. And uh, even though Rochambeau, who'd come over um, after the alliance, um, was always serving under Washington, uh, their relationship was, was one of equals. And the, the soldiers uh, respected each other. Um, the, even after the war, uh, Washington came to rely on Rochambeau's advice. And at the end, there's a wonderful little line where he says, we have uh, lived together as brothers, which is one of the reasons why my book is, is, is so titled. So there, there, this is something that if, if you've ever been in uniform, no matter who you're serving with, the bonds between people who are fighting in a common cause far outweigh any differences that the nationalities might have uh, caused for division. So in my period the, that I covered, it was more that uh, to turn, you know, band of brothers idea that uh, brought the, the two together. Then, of course, things changed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's this, um, it's, a, it's a really funny, you know, sort of paradoxical relationship, right? this, this kind of French-American relationship, or for a long time, it was a British-French relationship. I mean, they'd been at war, you know, like just 10 years earlier, like you were saying, they'd been at war really for a century. I mean, the, the, the New England colonists had been um, fighting French um, settlers. And, and, uh, and, and anti-Catholicism was such a big part of British um, kind of political culture and self-identity. And then, and then the revolution comes along, and all of a sudden, everybody's pro-French, and they're celebrating the French. <laughs> and you know, they're, they're celebrating the birth of the Dauphin, and, and they've got pictures of Louis XVI. You know, this, the, this revolutionary power has pictures of the monarch. Um, but but underneath, underneath this apparent transformation, I think there are, there are continuities as well. Uh, um, you know, there's a kind of undercurrent of anti-French and anti-Catholic sentiment that continues. Um, maybe, I don't know, it goes underground or something like that. And it's not too hard to, um, to sort of um, unleash it, you know, to, to activate these currents. And, and I think um, it, it explains, in, I mean, in large part, the, the, the equally sudden transformation, I mean, the same kind of transformation in reverse, I mean, as that, uh, that happens in the 1790s. So, so when the French Revolution breaks out in, in 1789, everybody's pro-French. You know, now the last real problem with, with France as an ally, the, it, that the fact that it's the most powerful absolutist monarchy in the world, um, is 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 gone. So now, now these are these are these are two sister republics. Um, so the Franco-American alliance seems stronger than ever. But within five years, by the mid 1790s, uh, they're they're um, mid to late 1790s. They're in a, they're in a quasi war with each other. There's a huge falling out. And and I think. Um, and I think that has to do with the, the kind of continuity of these, of these anti-French um, sentiments. The other, the other thing, I mean, so it can be partly based on, on, on culture, I think, partly based on, on religion. Um, but there was, you know, there was a French, it, you know, there's a tendency to view this kind of falling out in, in the quasi-war and the Alien and Sedition Acts, the very strong nativist sentiments that, and laws that, that emerged in the late 1790s, um, which people still refer to today, uh, as, as a kind of outbreak of, of of anti-immigrant and anti-French, in particular, paranoia. Um, but I, I will say that there were there were some um, there were some reasons to to, to be worried about the French um, presence and French ambitions in North America by the late 1790s. And part of that has to do with the ways that French settlement had 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 uh, developed in in the previous centuries. So so the French had been um, had had you know were never a, a, a settler colony, a settler dominated colony, except with a, with a small exception of the Saint Lawrence Valley. Um, but most of New France had been, had been a, a system of alliances between Native Americans and, and French settlers and French traders. 
um, and French military officers. And, and Native, even long after France left um, the, the, the continent, these um, Native Americans continued to, 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 to um, dominate Western regions militarily, and many of them, and many of these um, old French alliances existed. So there was a, there was a scene in one, in one of the um, books, Liancourt wrote this eight volume memoirs of his, of his travels, and there's a scene in there one time where he's, he's talking about being out west, um, he's, he's in the west, and, and, and he, seems, he hears some, someone speaking French, and, and so he tries to find out what it is, and it's a, it's a Native American, and then there's this conversation, um, and he says, uh, the, the, the Indian says to him, you know, the, the, the Americans, they're our brothers, but the French, they were our fathers, um, and and there's a kind of um, there's a, there's a sense that there's this strong bond, and that and French authorities are actually counting on this when they're looking um, to the West in the 1790s. They're counting on these old alliances to be uh, to be remobilized, and Americans are quite quite worried about this. So you know, it's not just a cultural thing. There are also kind of strategic reasons that there's this kind of turn towards an anti-French um, uh, sentiment. But but that's you know this like this kind of love love hate. Fear relationship is is very continuous. I mean, when I started the research on this book, it was the era of Freedom Prize and and uh, you know pouring out <laughs> French wine in the in the gutter. So so that you know there there are some things that, that continue. One one thing though during this period, if I can uh, jump in, the um, the link between the the militaries uh, remained reasonably strong. Um, it was at this during this period when uh, the uh, the new nation had decided that it needed to have a professional army even in uh, peacetime, and so it was uh, under Thomas Jefferson a little bit later that uh, the idea of a military academy, which had first been proposed by uh, one of the characters I, I pointed out earlier, Duporte, um, was created at West Point. And the first uh, supervisors of West Point uh, were, the, were the first leaders of the Army Corps of Engineers were French, and they continued to maintain that connection, many of the, um, the, the textbooks, much of the training, much of the instruction continued to uh, come over from there. And on the armament side, we began to create a system of manufacture. Uh, I mentioned that we had no real capability of making arms. Well, that changed when many of the French engineers stayed. Mm -hmm. And they began to create factories. Many more came during the, the period that you were referring to, most of you know about DuPont, and he was one of the, uh, the family um, of DuPont was one of the um, gunpowder manufacturers. Uh, and as they uh, were able to impart their knowledge, the Americans did what Americans do best. We take what other people uh, have and we change it and we create our own uh, system out of it. And so the American system of manufacture, which became what we would call today mass production, really began with many of the French engineers and processes that had come over, and uh, starting in the military, but then elsewhere. So there were always, always despite the, the sentiments of perhaps larger parts of the population, there were always strands that, of, of connection that remained strong um, throughout this, this era. Well, and there was, of course, the founding of the Society of the Cincinnati, which was an organization of American and French military officers who had served in the American <coughs> Revolution. And I mean, this was a very visible and controversial sign of this continuing relationship. And the organization still exists. The yes. building is uh, you know, right here in Washington. And it's still a hereditary organization where the membership goes to the first born son in France or in the United States. So yeah, that was one of the continuing bonds as well. Um, but you know, one of the other things you mentioned, uh, Larry, is that uh, France and Spain entered the war for their particular purposes, not because they were enamored of Republican government, not because no. they were actually that sympathetic to the idea of the United States becoming an independent nation, but because they had their own strategic goals uh, with, with relation to, to Britain, right? Yes. And um, I think, you know, that continues, um, that sort of geopolitics continues into your period. And um, do you want to talk about, Francois, the, the story of how the United States got the Louisiana Purchase? Because I don't think it's widely known outside of historian circles. And I think it's one that is fascinating. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, so so after, um, as I said, you know, when the when when the French um, intervened in the American Revolution, they had they had ideas that the that this would help them. I mean, there was always this expectation that that France would would uh, be in war with Britain before long, um, and there was this sense that in the next war. Um, having having the United States as an ally to, to, to France will be very useful for our operations in the Caribbean. They, they had been thrashed, as you say, in the Seven Years' War um, it, it, in terms of their naval operations, and they had lost many of these very lucrative sugar islands, which they managed to get back in the peace. But but there's a sense that, that these North American colonies um, in British possession make our Caribbean colonies very... Um, very precarious. Very, we, our hold is very tenuous. So, so the French think that by detaching um, the, the North American colonies, not only will they, not only would they, um, would they weaken the British Empire, but they would strengthen their own hold on the on the Caribbean. Um, now, because of the kind of diplomatic and, and 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 military falling out that happened in the 1790s, it wasn't working out this way. The the the, the Americans in in George Washington. Um, with the outbreak of the French Revolution, declared neutrality. I mean, with the outbreak, I should say, of war between France and Britain, declared neutrality. And this this was really a betrayal of the of the Treaty of of Amity and Commerce, which um, which the French <coughs> signed with the Americans, the American Revolution. I mean, the French were expecting the United States to to um, to stand by their side. I mean, I don't think anybody expected them to send some battalions over to Europe to march against Britain. But but you know, to to, to provision uh, French ships. Um, to uh, to man to help man for, and repair French ships to use these harbors these these beautiful harbors along the coast um, against British um, against British warfare which which the United States systematically uh, refused to do now many historians will say this was you know this was a very wise decision by by George Washington but it was it was not what the French had gone into the revolution expecting um, so so uh, so they began to to decide by the late 1790s that it would be important to have colonies of their own, uh, French colonies of their own, in order to maintain their hold on the Caribbean. And this was the main reason that Napoleon became interested in reacquiring Louisiana, because Louisiana, which, which wasn't just the state of Louisiana, but which was in the entire Mississippi Valley, everything really up, up from the Mississippi River all the way to the Rocky Mountains, would, um, would serve all these purposes that they were expecting from the United States. That is to say, it would, it would provide bases for naval uh, support, it would provide um, supplies for the French um, colonies, for the, for the Caribbean colonies. Um, so it would, it would, it would, in a sense, replace the United States. Now that the United States had proved itself this very fickle ally, um, so so that was why Napoleon wanted the the. So he sent he sent a huge army over to um, to take Louisiana. Um, the 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 problem was that the Caribbean, from his perspective, was that the Caribbean colonies were um, were in outright revolution. Slavery uh, was was undermined dramatically by the Haitian Revolution, um, and so in order to um, to to, to re-energize the sugar economy, he, he sought to put um, the, the the freed slaves back into slavery. So he sent this um, army of tens of thousands of French troops uh, first to Saint Domingue, uh, and the expectation was they would put down the Haitian Revolution, they would put the slaves. Uh, the, the former slaves, the freed slaves, back into slavery, and from there they would sail on to New Orleans and and take take um, take hold Louisiana. And it, you know it's very hard to imagine how the Americans would have dislodged this massive French army from from New Orleans. Uh, so, but it didn't it didn't work out that way. It was the Haitian. It was the success of of the of the freed slaves of the former slaves in in defeating the French forces. I mean, tens of thousands. It was it was more French soldiers died in Saint Domingue in Haiti than died in Waterloo. Um, it was it was a brutal uh, war, and um, and the and and the French army was defeated. And and once it was defeated, there was no way that they could go to New Orleans and hold Louisiana. And in fact, there wasn't much purpose actually in having Louisiana anyway. The purpose had been for the Caribbean, and they had lost the most important Caribbean colony. Um, so so it was the success of the of the Haitian uh, Revolution that that led to the Louisiana Purchase. It was at that point that that Napoleon decided to sell um, this now largely worthless piece of land to the Americans. Um, from his perspective, uh, and so so he so, so he sold it to the Americans because, and you know, and, and this is one of the the great kind of historical paradoxes and ironies. It was the success of of Haitian slaves in freeing themselves and fighting off the French and and, and maintaining their freedom that led to the to the massive expansion of American slavery into the Cotton Belt, into the Deep South, mm -hmm. um, across Alabama and Mississippi, and into and, and into the Mississippi Valley, and and you know, in a sense, kind of set the stage if you want to think about it that way for the Civil War uh, mm. a few generations later. Yeah, great. Well, so we can keep chattering among ourselves, but we'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. You can go to the microphones, either there or there. Don't be shy. Hi, 
Thank you very much. This is very fascinating so far. Really appreciate it. Um, I had a question about um, the, the willingness of the United States to, um, you said that, you know, certainly we, we were interested in having um, France and Spain as allies. We needed the gunpowder. You know, we needed their assistance. So we were thinking about it in terms of cost and benefit to the United States. And so I was wondering to what extent was the United States willing to make additional concessions to these foreign powers? Like one of you had mentioned previously that, you know, Spain was trying to recapture some territory in Florida. And, you know, certainly the, the French had additional interest in the United States as well. So was there any sort of discussion um, among the, you know, the nascent American, um, you know, uh, in, in like politics in the United States on like what we were willing to concede to these foreign powers? Thank you. Um, the, the, the alliance uh, between, was always between the United States and France. Spain did not formally ally with the Americans, so there really were no treaty negotiations uh, to speak of and certainly no concessions. Concessions came afterwards when they were um, debating about where the line of control on the Mississippi was. But during the war, the Treaty of Alliance and also the Military Treaty in 1778, uh, primarily there was the Treaty of um, Amity and Commerce, which I, I think the, uh, said we will be nice to each other and we'll trade. Actually, it was based on John Adams' model treaty that uh, was very specific, uh, specifically economic in, in nature. And that's what um, Franklin had, had kind of gone over with originally. And the, the military treaty uh, said very little that I can remember uh, in 1778 about any concessions, about land. There was nothing in there about we're going to pay for this or pay for that. This was, this was not a transaction. This was a treaty. There's a difference. Um, treaties are, I've got your back, you've got my back. Um, so in this case, it was America uh, agreed that it would not end the, fi uh, the, the fighting unilaterally, nor would it uh, make a separate peace with Britain. And as far as France was concerned, um, it would not stop fighting until Britain agreed uh, to the sovereignty of the United States. So that, that, those were the terms of the treaty. And when Spain ally, uh, um, wrote the codicil in 1779 to its alliance with France, that was called the Treaty of Aranjuez, um, it also stipulated that Spain would not stop fighting until Britain agreed to the sovereign to the United States. So there, again, no direct alliance, but Spain and France together said, um, Britain is either, you know, either we're going to be defeated or Britain is going to um, uh, recognize America as an independent nation. So could did that you, answer your question? Could you at this point mention that the biggest battle of the American Revolution did not occur on American soil because this place <clears throat> is now in the news again? So um, I was kind of surprised to see that the siege of Gibraltar, which started the day after the Treaty of Aranjuez was signed and didn't end until 17, you know, actually until the, the treaties were, were signed, <coughs> probably pulled in more soldiers and sailors from both sides. Um, the numbers I saw were something like 60,000 uh, Spanish troops uh, were arrayed around, uh, uh, let me just quickly set the stage, maybe not all of you knew that Gibraltar had been British territory, even though it was physically attached to Spain, since um, 1704. I may have the date a little bit wrong. And it had always been a thorn in Spain's side. For Britain, this was a strategic uh, point because it, of course, guards the entrance to the Atlantic and to the Mediterranean. Remember, Britain is a naval power. Britain's army was OK, but Britain's navy was second to none. Which is why, uh, and so uh, Gibraltar was always that naval stronghold, which is why they fought so hard to keep it. And that battle raged, the siege raged uh, for four years. And there was a battle that took place in, in 1782, I think September, um, that was so fierce, um, the, uh, there were something like one shell fired every three seconds. And by the end of it, 
Um, there were explosions uh, with mushroom clouds, the same as you would see over um, Japanese cities 200, uh, 200 and something years later, mushroom clouds rising over the harbor. Um, this was just a, a fiercely fought battle, and Britain never, you know, never gave in. And you know, they, they came away at the end um, still in possession. So this is why uh, I've said one of the things, and you said this, Rosemary, very well, we've had an American-centric view of the war, but many of the battles took place well outside the, the view or even the knowledge of the Americans. The Britain um, really wasn't um, beaten as much as they were just overwhelmed. Mm. Yes? Comments very much. Uh, I, as I understand it, these five were refugees uh, after the French Revolution took a more decided leftward turn. So what was their position in 1793 when the Jeffersonians and their allies were urging uh, that the U.S. give aid um, to France during the war on the continent. Did they just lie low? Were they part of the game? What did they do when Citizen Genet came over? Yeah, uh, so, that's, so that's a great question. Um, they, they, the short answer is that they were lying low um, in, this, in this period. I mean, they, they, had, they had represented this kind of political center in France, a kind of, a kind of centrist, you know, a kind of li you know, political liberalism, really, uh, which which collapsed uh, as the as the French Revolution became more more radical as the as the Jacobins um, and the Girondins took took power, um, and and so they were forced to flee and and they, um, as far as I can tell, they never gave up their sense of of Frenchness if you want to think about it that way. Uh, they they never came um, to the United States thinking that they were going to stay. Uh, the only possible exception is Noai, whose whose wife um, and and father were executed uh, in in ninety three. Um, but but. Uh, but for the most part, they, they always understood themselves as, as in temporary exile. Um, and, and in the early years that they were here, in, in, in 94, 95, um, they don't seem to have had any kind of political ambitions, so far as I can understand it. No, I was hanging out with, with, with Hamilton and, and actually giving him some suggestions on, on military um, operations or you know, troop, troop movements or things like that. Uh, for training, not not you know those not not for for war purposes, but and they would they would go to Washington had these levies. Um, George Washington was was president at the time. He had these levies, and they would go and and, and socialize. Some of them had known Washington uh, earlier, or had correspondence with him. No, I had, had fought with Washington, um, and and Washington decided actually. So to answer your question about Genet, uh, this was when Genet came over um, as 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 ambassador, and he didn't want he didn't want these guys having anything to do. With with Washington, he he feared the French ministry, Fouché, the, the person who preceded, and then and then Genet feared that the that that these guys were trying to um, sway the the Americans um, towards in an alliance with Britain. That that wasn't a founded um, that was unfounded that that fear, but but it, that was what they worried about. And eventually, Washington acceded to these demands. He said, um, I, "They can't come to my to my levies anymore, to my public uh, receptions." So so they stopped coming. They're socializing. They socialized mostly in Federalist circles. Um, Volney was was good friends with Jefferson, and he visited and he spent he spent a, a few days or maybe a few weeks with uh, at Monticello, and they had a, a long correspondence with Jefferson later repudiated, but um, but they but otherwise they were mostly sort uh, sort of in Federalist political circles, and I think that's you know their their kind of closest political alliances uh, or sympathies would have been with the Federalists, but they never got involved in Federalist politics. Now that changed by 1796 as. Um, as as the, the the falling out began between France and the United States, they seem to have been um, they seem to have become more. Now I never you know there was no smoking gun or anything like that that I found out. Talleyrand had already left, um, but Liancourt I think was was passing information, not sensitive military or political, but just kind of political information I think um, to the to the then French ambassador who Genet had been uh, expelled long ago, um, and uh, and so so they were understood to be. In alliance with with uh, France at that point, and and there were some fears, and I think not unfounded fears. Volney was traveling in the West, and it wasn't clear what he was doing. He was in the Ohio Valley. There were other people at the same time, um, French officers who were actually spies, um, who were traveling along the Ohio Valley along similar routes, looking at American forts, um, uh, sort of military encampments, and and who were clearly drawing up designs for for take, taking back this um, this this area. Now, I don't think Leon Coul was doing that, and I don't think Volney was doing that. But they were associated with these people. So eventually, um, the the ones who were still here in 1798, when the Alien and Sedition Acts were were passed, were actually targeted for expulsion. So 
So Volney had to, had to leave the country. Um, Moho left the country because they were, they were actually um, you know, kicked out or they, they were about to be kicked out. So, so their politics, you know, in a sense, their politics may have stayed the same, but, but everything was swirling around them. French politics was changing so dramatically. Uh, diplomatic relationships were changing. Um, so you know, I, I, I sort of see them as having, having not changed very much. Um, in their own views, but everything else changed around them. The whole world turned around them, in a sense, um, and so, so the, the situation looked quite different at the can, end. Can, can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah. Okay, because I've always had trouble explaining the quasi-war with France, yeah. even have, after having read many things. In, in, can you draw us kind of a straight line uh, of, of what the events were that led to and, why, and, and, and then what caused it to dissipate? Well, the, the, so the, the Franco-American alliance by this time had been, uh, had been uh, really, it was in tatters uh, by, by this point. Um, so now I'm talking 1797. Uh, there, are, there are really powerful um, anti-French sentiments that are, that are re-emerging. Um, there's there's Fred, American ships being, being sort of captured by French shipping in the Caribbean. Uh, and so, so there's a, there's, there's, um, a sense, and, and, and the Federalists who've always been anti-French revolution since, since the, maybe not the very outbreak, but since 1791 anyway, um, they, they, they're mobilizing for war. They, they view, view, um, view anti-French political sentiment as their means to, to get back into power, um, or to hold on to power anyway. Um, so, so John Adams sends a, a diplomatic um, a, a contingent to, to Paris to try to negotiate some kind of peace. Adams uh, did not want war with France. There were, there were, there were Arch Federalists, including Hamilton, who were mobilizing for war against France, as um, and and they were they they were right. I mean, this was their path to power. You know, it's not not the first or the last time that people would view uh, war as as their path to, to to political power or to hanging on to political power. And Adams, um, to I think his his I mean, in my this is my editorial comment to, yeah. to his great credit, actually. Um, uh, did not want a war. He, he didn't think that the United States was, was ready to, to handle a war with France, and he was probably right about that. So he sent this, this mission to, to, to the great uh, despair of his political allies to, to France to try to negotiate a, a, a peace, which was, which was um, with Talleyrand, who by this time was the foreign minister. Talleyrand um, handled this very badly. He, he, um, he, he demanded bribes rather than, um, rather than um, negotiate peace. And, and In great. I think he he really mis yeah he was <laughs> he was ungrateful i mean he misread the political situation in part from 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 his experiences in the united states actually so he radically misread this so so he um, demanded bribes and 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 two of the american uh, negotiators left in a huff one tried to, to, to keep things together and and this is when there were there were these demands for war i mean so so despite john adams he he had to accede and and hamilton became general um, uh, Washington was named general. I mean, it's, it's this kind of weird moment, and it was it was a quasi war. It's the first, I think. You know, this is a kind of interesting moment, actually, in military history. I don't know, but I think it may be the first time um, there is a sort of undeclared war, uh, this this kind of low grade war. Um, so, and and it has it basically it's about military um, uh, battles, uh, you know, uh, on sea. Um, and, but it's an undeclared war, and you know there are some interesting parallels between that kind of Cold War um, later. I mean, the, the ways in which war is, is, is conducted. Uh, but ultimately, um, ultimately, this, this uh, you know, Adams basically restrains um, restrains things, and, and Talleyrand comes to his senses and negotiates a peace with the United States. So, so, so the, the cover never completely blows off. But, but these, you know, it's basically naval operations in the Caribbean um, with with ships being captured. I mean. You know, the last thing and I'll say, and I'll stop, but the, the, the line between formal war and, 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 un, uh, and, and not is, is unclear because a lot of war has to do, a lot of operations have to do, and you know this much better than I do, has, have to do with privateering. So these are kind of private commercial shipping which are, which are, are given letters which allow them to, um, which allow them to fight, at, you know, in, in, as a kind of de facto navy. Um, and so that's what's going on. It's, it's privateering in the Caribbean here, which is going on in there. Oh, thank One you. One little footnote. This is when... Um, the Dr. George Logan of the Logan Act is a private citizen from Philadelphia, goes over and unilaterally, on his own authority, tries to negotiate a, a settlement with, with France. And after that, the Congress passes this law that is being invoked today, um, strangely enough. Um, so. See, yeah, history's, he was a, he was a Republican. He was a, Repu he was a Republican, and he didn't want he didn't want this war. And he went, yeah, exactly, to try to unilaterally to buy his, on his own on his own accord to try to negotiate peace. And, and it was it was not viewed well by the Federalists uh, for for um, obvious reasons. We have a very patient questioner over here. 
Thank you very much. I was wondering whether there's uh, other narratives, uh, a French perspective on this, and also a perspective of the Native American. So let me just start it off. I mean, this war that George Washington had participated in in 1752, which was a disaster. Actually started the war. He, he started the war. So it was basically going into the Ohio Valley and trying to take that land. And as a result of that, the French and the Indians defeated that uh, operation. And uh, uh, some treaties came out of it that basically restricted the expansion of the United States to the Appalachian Mountains. So those were the treaties that were in effect that allowed the, the French and the Indians to get along quite well or in their relationships and kept the, uh, the Americans from expanding. After the American Revolution, all bets were off. This was the expansion into the Indian territories, the Ohio Valley. It was quite uh, destructive to Native populations. And also, I guess it, it was a little upsetting as well to the French, who thought they would have some kind of a. And then the buildup of what you call this undeclared war, as the Federalists, especially up in New England, looked towards Canada as, their first, as the first part of Manifest Destiny, which eventually results in the burning of York, the capital of Canada, and the, uh, a kind of a America on its own, which led to the burning of Washington in, 17, uh, in, in, in 1814. So um, I'm thinking that there must be also a, a, a different perspective from the Canadian point of view, from the French point of view, and from the Native American point of view, yeah. and, and, and how, how we can uh, kind of understand our current history, which is also continually spreading its values with, with uh, well, I guess with some uh, uh, military force, how, uh, you know, we can, because we, we build on these ideas that it's, it's all good to be a part of this expansion with weapons. And I mean, I'm just thinking that maybe there's another way of approaching it. We've reached, <laughs> in fact, uh, maybe the end of empire. Okay. Um, so th the, the perspectives you're referring to Native Americans and the, and the effect on them, also um, the enslaved people, uh, the people of Canada, yeah, are part of the, as Rosemary had said, the, the wave of, uh, histor of, of historical studies that have recast the revolution and its aftermath in, in new lights. Now I can recommend, um, the, the book I can think of for Canada is in French, and, and the name will come to me eventually, um, but for the other aspects you're referring to, the Indian and others, I can heartily rec recommend, now first buy my book, then buy <laughs> Francois' book, sorry, he'll, he'll tell you, he'll say, no, first buy my book, then buy Alan Taylor's American Revolutions, and you might want to also get, I think uh, you can get a good two-for-one discount um, for his, with his American colonies, and he treats very well um, exactly the aspects you're talking about. American Revolutions goes from about 1750, actually precedes the Seven Years' War all the way through to about 1820 or so, and it talks about that sweep of uh, history that, of which the American War of Independence is one part, and it's a civil war that continues, and the, the drive into the Ohio Valley afterwards displacing the native nations um, all becomes part of that fabric, and it is quite well done. So um, I can't really answer the question because somebody else already has, yeah. is what I'm suggesting. I mean, I think, you know, uh, from, from the, the kind of Native American perspective, the, the revolution, I mean, long term was not, was, was, was a catastrophe. Um, I mean, a success of the American Revolution, that is to say. Um, I think it's, you know, had, had the Americans not, not um, won <laughs> that war, I mean, who knows, you know, we're in the realm of fiction here. Uh, but but they you know I think uh, they would have been in a stronger position. The Iroquois mostly allied with with Britain with the British Empire. I mean they had long long standing alliances, but there were also obvious reasons for them to be supporting the the British. Only only the Oneida um, allied with the Americans, and that was a bad bad bet for them. The, the Iroquois lost. Uh, I mean you know the, the the British lost, so so they so they were not in a good position after the war. Now I mean I I've come around to thinking that that from from a kind of General Native American perspective, if you can, if you can, if you can posit such a thing, um, you know the the this this whole period from the outbreak of the Seven Years' War until 
really until the War of 1812, which you were referring to in, in your question, was one long uh, war to, to maintain their territory, to keep, to keep the British and, and then the Americans out of, out of their territory, and ultimately a losing battle, but there were, a losing war, but there were uh, several sort of pivot points, and there, were, there were several moments where things could have turned out quite differently, where it's not hard to imagine um, things turning out differently, and one of them actually is one you were uh, referring to, you know, when the, when the French and the Americans signed this alliance, the, the Americans committed themselves to not negotiating a separate peace with Britain, um, and they broke that. They were not fickle, the reliable allies. They broke that that um, yes, commitment, um, and it's and it's largely be because they thought, and they were probably right about that, that the French were going to try to keep this um, the Ohio Valley as neutral territory, neither British uh, nor American, um, and and so the Americans didn't want that, and so they they got this concession from Britain by negotiating a separate peace. Um, from the Canadian perspective, so Canadian perspective, I you know I don't. I don't it's a complicated question because, first of all, there is no Canada until much later. So this yeah. is really British, British North America. You know, things things get reappropriated. So um, not too long ago, in the War of you know 200th anniversary of the War of 1812, there were there were attempts to call it Canada's War. I mean, the, the government at the time um, was kind of mobilizing this, which always made me laugh because you know there was no Canada. Nobody was fighting on behalf of Canada. But you know, in retrospect, it becomes Canada's War. But I think, I mean, that, that is a moment, another of these kind of pivot points when, when things could have turned out quite differently. I mean, the Americans invaded Canada, as you say, um, invaded British North America, um, uh, Upper Canada, um, and, and they, they, could have, um, they, they, they could have taken it. They thought they, they, they were going to. And in retrospect, it, they, they were pushed out by the British Empire. In retrospect, it becomes a moment where uh, Canadian sovereignty is, is established, um, where what's now considered Canadian sovereignty. And, and that really wouldn't be contested. Um, after that, I mean, there were rebellions in the 1830s, but but the Americans at that point, by that point, had no interest in in allying themselves with with uh, patriot rebellions, as they call them, um, in Canada. So so that that in retrospect emerges as the final kind of the last the last attempt during the American Revolution. There were attempts to uh, by the Americans to invade Canada. They thought the French settlers would rise up in alliance with them. It wasn't it wasn't the case. Um, but but um, but these you know these two things are very much tied together. I mean this this attempt to, the American attempt you know they were continually pushing wanting to push west and it was uh, uh, first they were pushing up against the French and then they were pushing up against the British government as as you said in the 18th, in the 1760s and, and and they never wanted these restrictions and then they were pushing up continually against the Native Americans and and it was this kind of relentless push west that that drove a lot of this early history in this period. Yeah. And by the way, I don't want to uh, leave Spain out. Um, although um, I, I'm not going to go into any detail, the same forces were happening um, in Spanish Florida um, as well as further to the west in what was then the um, uh, vice royalty of uh, New Spain, which was today Mexico all the way up through much of the southwest. And there, there were the same tensions there and quite often uh, very rocky relationships. So you know, when you think about North America, it really is a, a confluence of, of three large colonial powers all trying to push in the same directions. And uh, the, the Native American nations who were not uh, in any way you know, a monolithic set of, of nations, but many, um, you know, many nations uh, 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 arrayed around the lands um, were continually being forced into regions that they, they did not uh, uh, traditionally inhabit, nor did they want to be in. So, you know, the the whole history is is starting to uh, look less, uh, you know, as, as you're starting to see historians rethink this, less this this relentless push west as much as it is, it's pushing from the north, it's pushing from the east to the west, and also pushing from the south, um, and you know. The, what is always amazing to me, though, is uh, at this point, you know, we're talking uh, end of the 18th century, there's three big actors um, in you know, playing, playing the roles pretty much around the, the whole of North America. Fast forward uh, just about 30 years, and suddenly there's uh, a dozen or more independent nations suddenly um, in this territory that used to just be the... Um, the battleground of three great powers. Now it's a half dozen or a dozen nations uh, uh, trying to figure out where they're going to go from there. That was really the impact of this revolution and post-revolution period. Great, thank you. Um, so closing remarks.
closing questions to the audience? Oh, yeah. Uh, by the way, we didn't let you know that there's going to be a quiz when you... <laughs> in French. In French. No. Um, so we'd like to remind you that both books will be for sale. Both authors will be available for book signing. There is a 15% discount. And we would invite you to read more deeply into this fascinating new approach to the era of the American Revolution. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.